الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعض فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ صدق الله العظيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا ألهمنا رشدنا وعزنا من شرور أنفسنا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى آمين يا رب العالمين Dear brothers and sisters and sons and daughters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh With the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are beginning our one month long program of series of lectures on the exegesis of Al-Quran Al-Kareem As you must be knowing, this evening's lectures are introductory. We have to discuss a few things about the Quran, its compilation, its basic terminology, the mode of its revelation, and the modes of interpretation, specific mode of interpretation relating to the context and generalized mode of interpretation which is meant for the whole of humanity for all times to come. I propose to divide these subjects in two lectures and I am beginning with topic number one that is what is our basic Iman or faith or belief or so to say aqeedah or as others may call it dogma about the Quran. Two things should be clear. Number one, Al-Quran is the word of Allah, speech of Allah, it's kalam Allah as we find in ayah number six of Surah Al-Tawbah, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغُ مَأْمَنَا If anyone from the mushrikeen, those who have signed partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask your protection and security to come to you and listen to the kalam of Allah, grant him the surety and protection so that he can listen to the kalam of Allah and then let him reach his place of safety and security. So this is Kalam Allah. This word of Allah or Kalam of Allah or speech of Allah was conveyed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Son of Abdullah, son of Abdul Muttalib, Al-Hashmi, Al-Qarshi, from the progeny of Ismail, son of Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Actually, this was again conveyed through speech. It was not conveyed as a written text. Speech of Allah conveyed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through speech of Jibreel alayhi salatu wa sallam. That is why we find in Quran, in Surah Al-Takweer, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ مَكِينٍ مُطَاعٍ ثَمَّ أَمِينٍ you know, these attributes and these words are being used for Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. The qawl of Rasul in Kareem. Because actually, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to it. It was not delivered to him in written form. Then thirdly, this kalam of Allah, this word of Allah, the speech of Allah was conveyed to the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through the speech of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again, the medium was spoken word, not written word. 
And that is why we find in Surah Al-Haqqa, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ So this is one thing which must be very clear. It is kalam of Allah, it is speech of Allah, conveyed through the kalam and speech of Jibreel to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and through his speech and kalam to his companions and from them to the humanity at large so that it has reached us now. Let me give here a quotation from the former book of Allah. You know the former book of Allah was Torah. And there is the prophecy of this Quran and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, both. In verses 18 and 19 of chapter 18 of Deuteronomy, Kitabul Istisna, wherein Allah said to Moses, Verily I shall raise from their brothers a prophet like you, and I will put my words into his mouth and he will say to the people whatever I will put in his mouth. So now who were the brothers of Bani Israel? Surely they were Bani Ismail. I will raise from their brothers. Actually, these are the two branches of the progeny of Ibrahim والسلام, from Ibrahim Ismail, from Ibrahim Ishaq, from Ishaq Yaqub, and the twelve sons of Yaqub, they are Bani Israel. So I will raise from their brothers. It cannot denote except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It cannot be applicable to any of the biblical prophets in no way. So this prophecy is very important because it is confirming the position of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as that he will deliver the words of Allah. I will put in his mouth my word. And he will say to the people, tell the people, whatever I put into his mouth. So this is the prophecy of Torah which came true in the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the advent of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in the coming down of this book, this final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the second part of our dogma, but this word is not good. And I don't like the word Aqeedah also. Aqeedah is a true representation of dogma. You will never find this word in Quran or Hadith, Aqeedah. This terminology has erupted later on, after the days of the companions. Iman, that's the basic term of Quran and Hadith and Sunnah. But we use these terms, so I'm also using the second most important integral part of our Aqeedah about Quran is or our faith, our belief about Quran is that it is protected and preserved from any changes, alterations, any corruption of the text as well as of the essential meanings. There can be difference of opinion regarding interpretation, but the essential meanings will remain the same and especially the text will not be corrupted. So what we have with us, this Qur'an, is exactly the same Qur'an which came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he delivered to his companions, رضي الله تعالى عنهم اجمعين. And then they delivered to the tabi'een. And then it came to the tab'a tabi'een and so on, generation after generation. Qurra, experts in the qiraat of Qur'an, taking Qur'an from mouth to mouth. Actually, this written word and written, you know, th th shape of communication, it came later. Basically, Quran is Kalam, and it was conveyed through Kalam, and it was propagated through Kalam. But let me quote here three ayat, which are very important, regarding the preservation and protection of this book, which must be an integral part of our faith and iman. If a Muslim has any doubt about the preservation or protection of Quran, actually something is wrong with his demand. Maybe, I don't dare say, but maybe he's outside the pale of Islam. 
if he doesn't believe that this Quran is mahfuz because it was guaranteed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm giving you three ayat of the Quran. In Surah Al-Qiyamah, Allah Ta'ala said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ لِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبِعْ قُرْآنَ ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ These are four very important ayat of Surah Al-Qiyamah. You know, when Quran was being revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to exert himself to remember it, lest he should forget any word. He knew the responsibility, the word of Allah is coming to me, and I am the custodian of the word of Allah, and I have to convey it to the humanity, lest I should forget any word. So he was exerting himself, repeating and repeating and repeating, so that he could learn it correctly by heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assured him, La tuharrik bihi li sadaka. Don't take this exertion and don't move your tongue speedily with this book so that you can remember it very soon. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana. It's on us. We are responsible. We take the duty. We take the responsibility. You rest assured. Inna alayna jam'ahu. We shall compile it and jam'ahu wa qur'ana. And then we shall make you read it. So actually this Qur'an was stored in the heart and chest of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by a special act of miracle of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Why? Because the human effort was taken away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You need not take this exertion. We'll do it for you. Inna alayna jamu'ahu wa Qur'ana faiza qara'nahu fattabay Qur'ana Actually this second thing mentioned here denotes to another subject which I will discuss later. And that is the sequence, the editing and the compiling. This compiling and sequence and editing of this, these ayat, that is also our responsibility. We shall do it. Don't you worry about it. And when we fix that sequence and that compilation, then you have to follow that compilation. But in these ayahs, the most important word is inna alayna jam'ahu to collect it. That's our responsibility because in Arabic, you know, the harf jar, the preposition ala means a responsibility on someone. Al-Quran hujjatun laka aw alayka. Ala is the responsibility. Inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana. Faiza qara'nahu fattabi' qur'ana. Summa inna alayna bayana. Both of these responsibilities we are taking on ourselves and absolving you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the second ayah is the ayah number 9 of Surah Al-Hijr. Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. It is we who have made this Quran descend. Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra. And what is this Quran? A zikr. The reminding the remembrance because the Iman in Allah is there in the heart of every human soul in the spirit because the spiritual souls come from Allah Quran comes and all, all the books of Allah came to remind us we have just forgotten it we are not paying attention to it only it's a reminding a zikr Inna nahnu nazzalna zikr. We have made this zikr descend upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa inna lahu lahafizun. And we are its protectors. We shall protect it. This is guaranteed by us. Don't you worry, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's not your duty. Inna lahu lahafizun. If Allah guarantees that he will protect this Quran from any alteration, from any changes, from any corruption of the text or of essential meanings. Now, what does it mean? If somebody thinks that some changes have occurred, he doesn't believe in the omnipotence of Allah, then Allah is not omnipotent. He took upon himself that he will preserve it. 
and he couldn't preserve it. If supposedly it has been corrupted, somebody else, somebody has been successful in corrupting it or making any alteration in it, then what does it mean logically? It's the importance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the only potence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes. And this is kufr. That is why I said that whosoever believer believes that this Quran is not the Quran which was given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and which Muhammad gave to his companion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa raziyallahu ta'ala wa majma'een I think that his iman at least is not valid. And I think that even he is outside the pale of Islam. The third ayah is more profound, more important both than these, both of these ayahs. And this is from Hami Masajda, ayah number 42. La yatihi al-baatil min bayni yadayhi wa la min khalfihi. Baatil, falsehood cannot attack, attack this book, this Quran. Neither from the front nor from the back. Now this actually pertains to the essential meaning of Quran. La yatihi al-baatil, baatil falsehood. Falsehood cannot attack Quran. It is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot attack Quran, neither from the front, min bayne yaday, wala min khalfihi, nor from behind, from the back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting this last message of His to the humanity at large. There's a very beautiful couplet in Persian from Allama Iqbal, which covers this protection and preservation of the Quran in both these ways, textual and essential meanings of the Quran, both protected, guaranteed their protection, guaranteed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Harf ura reb ne, tabdeel ne, ayash sharmindae taweel ne. The word of this book cannot be corrupted, cannot be changed. Impossible. It cannot be done. And there can be no wrong interpretations of the ayat. The ayat are so self-sufficient, so self-protecting themselves that you know Batil cannot attack them. Harfeura Reb Ne Tabdil Ne Ayash Sharminday Tavil Ne. Now I go to the second part of the discourse today. The original Quran, where is it? What we have actually are the attested copies of the Quran. This is not the Quran that we read. This is Musaf. Where is the original Quran? Let me quote three ayat from the Quran. This Quran, this sublime Quran, is in the preserved tablet. Actual Quran is there. The original Quran is there. This is from Surah Al Buruj. The last part of, of the Quran contains this Surah, Surah Al Buruj. And this surah ends, بَلْ هُوَ قُرْآنٌ مَجِيدٌ فِي لَوْهِمْ مَحْفُوزٌ That law which is protected, that tablet, that tabloid you may say, it, which, has, which is pro protected. Now the second, Surah Al-Waqiyah, which I quoted in the Juma sermon also today. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَحْهَرُونَ this is a glorious Quran. And this is there in the hidden book. Not these apparent, you know, copies of the Quran. It is there in the Kitabim Maknoon. Maknoon. Hidden. In the Hula Quranun Kareem. Verily, it is the glorious Quran. Fi Kitabim Maknoon. And it is contained, it is written in that book which is hidden. La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharoon. Nobody can touch it except those who have been extremely purified. Who are they? They are the malaika. Al-malaika tul muqarrabun. Only they can touch this book. Now although from this ayah, 
the jurists of Islam, the fuqaha have derived, you know, an injunction that no Muslim should touch Quran when he is impure. He must be mutawadli, he must be with wudu, he must be pure, then he should touch. That is the legal interpretation that is also valid. But what this ayah means, la yamassuhu illa al-mutahharoon, and actually it pertains to the malaika, kiramim barara, to those kiramim barara, in the last part we find, find that, that these, these wordings about those malaika. Bi'aydi safaratin kiramim barara. Those are the people. Those are the, these, those are the custodians of that hidden book. La yamassuhu illa al-mutahharoon. But you know, about the third ayah, let me mention here, there's another meaning also. You can read Quran, you can have some knowledge of it, you can be able to translate it, but you cannot reach the inner core of its guidance unless your inner personality has been purified. You won't be able to touch the inner core that has to be there, Tazkiyah. That is why in Quran we find at three places Tazkiyah comes before Ta'aleem. First there is Tazkiyah, purification of the souls, purification of the intentions of men. And then if you approach Quran, you will be able to approach its true spirit, the inner core of its meanings. Otherwise you will just be going round and round. You won't be able to touch the inner spirit of the Quran. Anyhow, I was quoting only to the fact that this real Quran is in law mahfuz according to ayat of Surah Al-Buruj, in kitab al according to ayat of Surah Al-Waqiyah, and the third, that is from Surah Zukhruf, innahu fi ummil kitab ladayna la'aliyyul hakim. This is actually in the mother book, ummil kitab. The mother book which is with us, Ladaina, it is with us, La Aliyun Hakim. It's very high, very exalted, and profound wisdom is there in it. So actually the real book is with Allah. The real book, the real Quran is in the custody of the Safarat in Kiram in Barara. The only they can touch it. What actually we have, so to say, are the attested and certified copies of that real book. Now from that protected tablet or the hidden book now started the coming down of this Quran. And there are two phases of the coming down of the Quran. Because we find in the Quran two words, two words from the same root. Nazala yanzolo means to descend. Anzala yunzilo, somebody makes something, descend. Nazala yunazilo, again the same meaning, somebody making something else, descend. But what's the difference between Anzala yunzilo and Nazala yunazilo? Anzala yunzilo inzalan, making something descend immediately, at once, one piece, in one movement. And Nazala yunazilo, tanzilan. Making something descend gradually, bit by bit, by, to, after intervals. As you know, these are two words, ilam and ta'aleem. What is the ilam? To bring something to the notice of someone. That's, that's all. It has come to your notice, that's all. But ta'aleem, ta'aleem means to teach something, to hammer something into the understanding of that person. And it has to be gradual. It has to be a continuous and perpetual process. So inzal, sudden, coming down. And tanzil, coming down of Quran, gradually, bit by bit. Now these two words mostly you will find in the Quran. That in Laylatul Qadr, inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Here it is inzal. Anzala yunzala inzalam. Anzalnahu. In the same way we find in Surah Al-Dukhan, 
that the whole quran descended was made to descend from that hidden book from that preserved and protected tablet to the heaven of the earth as sama dunya it came down it came down in one month that is ramadan inna shahr ramadan alladhi unzila fihi alquran here again we find that the same word anzala yunzilu unzila that is majhul of the same word and the uh, the the lailatul qadr or lailatul mubarakah that is also in that shahr ramadan so in that night the whole quran was descended down to the heaven which is most proximal to the earth and from there it came down to the heart of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam bit by bit piece by piece gradually and this descending the second descending there was the first descending one piece total inna anzalnahu fi lailatul qadr inna anzalnahu fi lailatul mubarakah shahr ramadan alladhi unzila fi alquran but on muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam everybody knows that its descending its revelation was completed in about 23 years bit by bit surah by surah ayah by ayah sometimes a complete surah was revealed but you know mostly a few ayat and then a few ayat and the prophet used to tell the companions keep these ayat place these ayat after those ayat of the particular surah so that is how it was being compiled i will come to that subject later but i have given you that the real book of allah is in the law e mahfuz it is in the kitab e maknun it is ladaina it is with allah innahu fi ummil kitab the mother book is with us and what we have they are the attested or certified copies of that book that book was descended made to descend once whole one piece in lailatul qadr of the month of ramadan but then later on from there jibril alayhi salatu wassalam descended this book reveal the parts of this book gradually bit by bit now what was the time of its revelation must you know time and space complex there should be a background when was this book revealed because you must know the environments the conditions what was the state of humanity at that time at what level of consciousness most of the people were at that time so actually time and then space where it was revealed and when it was revealed and that is what i you know denoted to in this brochure the time and space background of the revelation of the quran that is very important must keep it so time is from the year 610 of the christian era to the year 632 of the christian era 22 years according to the solar calendar but according to the lunar calendar they become approximately 23 years you must keep you know that time factor in your mind and now let us proceed to the next where was it revealed is important had it been revealed in iran it would have discussed the same things but in different way because in iran in persia you had philosophy you had logic and quran should have addressed the people at the same level of consciousness at which they were practically at that time but you know quran has selected its own mode its own style and that actually we can appreciate 
by keeping in view the place where it was revealed, the people who were the first addressees of this Quran, to whom this Quran was addressing primarily, it was revealed in a small part of the Arabian Peninsula, not the whole of the Arabian Peninsula, mind it. The Arabian Peninsula is divided into three parts vertically, north-south. You know, there's a small strip. At some places it is 10, 5 to 10 miles, at some places 30, 60, 40 miles wide. It's plain along with the western coast of the Arabian Peninsula, the coast of Red Sea. Then there is Al-Hijaz. Al-Hijaz actually is a mountainous region. There are mountains. And Hijaz, Hajiz means something which intervenes between two things. So actually this Hijaz is intervening, dividing the Arabian Peninsula. On the east side of Hijaz is Najd. It's a plateau. But on the western side is plain. That is called Tehama. And intervening between the two is Hijaz. Now, Makkah is the city of Hijaz, Medina is the city of Hijaz, Taif is the city of Hijaz, but Jeddah is the city of Tehama, Rabir is the city of Tehama, and so on. And even Tabuk, you know, that's the northern tip of Hijaz. The same mountainous range going on, it's like, you know, a rampart. It's a, it's a wall separating the two parts, the Najd from Tehama, and this is Hijaz. So please note that Quran was revealed, nearly all of it in Hijaz. Although there were some very few expeditions of the Prophet ﷺ in Najd also. But you know, they are very few, very negligible. Maybe when he went to Najd, maybe some ayat were revealed during that journey. So they, they will become an exception. But mostly the two-thirds of the Quran is Makki, Meccan surahs. It was revealed in Makkah because for about 10 years Muhammad sallallahu never stepped out of Makkah. He was preaching and teaching and conveying the message to the people of Makkah. It was only after the 10th year, after the beginning of Wahi, when Abu Talib died, his protection, the worldly protection, when it, go, it was gone, then he had to seek for some alternate base and he went to Taif. Again, Taif is also a city of the same Hijaz. So actually all this part of Quran, two-third part of the Quran is composed of the Bakki Surahs. So that was revealed in that area, Makkah, Taif and its surroundings. And then you know Medina is again a town, a city of the same Hijaz. So mostly Quran was revealed, if not all, at least mostly it was revealed in Hijaz. But there is a very interesting exception, except two ayat. The last two ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah. آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ السُّورَةِ These were revealed not on earth. They were given to our Prophet Wasallam when he went to Miraj, Isra. And they were given there at the seventh heaven to Muhammad Wasallam as a gift, as a present to the Ummah, take it. That is the present of this, you may call it, that is your, for remembrance of this event, you, we are giving you these two ayat for your Ummah. So actually these two ayat, Muhammad received not on earth, but on the seventh heaven in the night of Miraj. Rest of the Quran came from the heavens to the earth to be revealed to Muhammad sallallahu now the next topic is language of the Quran. Everybody knows it's Arabic. Inna jalnahu Quranun Arabiyan. But which Arabic? There are so many Arabics. Not only today, there were so many Arabics in the day of the Prophet also. There were accents, different accents, different slangs. Today you know, the, a, an Arab from Libya cannot understand a person from Najd. Even during the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we find in the hadith that the deputation came from the Najd, the area of Najd. And what they were saying, the, the companions say, we couldn't understand. 
Only the Prophet was understanding what, he, what they were saying. He couldn't understand. The same Arabic language, but the accent was so different that the companions, people living in Madina, they couldn't understand it. So it was Arabic, no doubt. But there were so many Arabics. And they are, there are so many Arabics. And at the time of Muhammad Sallallahu also, there was no one Arabic. But which Arabic is the language of the Quran? It's the Arabic of Hijaz, to say it generally, but not of Hijaz also. The Arabic, the language of the Bedouins of Hijaz, not the urban Hijazis. Because the Arabs, you know, they thought that because to the cities, people come from outside. Some of them settled there. And especially in Mecca, you know, caravans were coming from Yemen, caravans from Syria, caravans coming and going. So actually, the language of the cities and towns is corrupted. It doesn't remain pure. That is why they used to send their newborns, you know, to the desert, go out to the desert and be raised among the Bedouins so that your language remains pure. So it's actually the language of the Bedouins of Hijaz. A few words occur in other accent also. And a few other words are there which are of some other language. For example, Persian, but they have been turned into Arabic love. Sange Gil, but it has been changed to Sijil. Sijil is Sange Gil. But these examples are again, you know, exceptional. Exceptions prove the rule. So the rule is the language of Quran is the language of the Bedouins, of Hijaz, of the days of Muhammad. And this language, very pure very sweet, very melodious. It has a melody, and it has a melody of its own. And we can call, and I dare call it, as the divine music. And that, you know, the urge in human beings for music that has also been satisfied by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this book of His, so that one can satisfy his urge for hearing some good voice, some music, melodious. Actually, that can also that is why the Prophet has said, Zayyinu al-Qur'an bi aswatikum. Man lam yataghanna bil Quran fa laysa minna. Try to read Quran with as better voice as you can. So actually, bring about the divine music that is inherent in this book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imbued in it. Now, what is the style of the Quran? We know certain styles, poetry for example, then prose, we, we have different types of proses essays, books, which consist of chapters. Quran doesn't fit in any of these definitions. First of all, we know it. Quran has several times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, it is not poetry. We have not taught poetry to our Prophet sallallahu and poetry is not worth worthy of him. It's something below his level. So it's not poetry. But please mind, today we have a special form of poetry and that is called blank verse. Blank verse has a resemblance to Quran, no doubt. Because in Quran we find, you know, that sounds, effect is present there. People, you, these, the kawafi which we call, but in Quran we call them fawasil. You know, the same similarity of voice and sounds appearing. So actually there is a melody and there is a music. So there is a blank verse type of thing in Quran, but not the poetry, the regular poetry, which the Arabs knew or most of the people knew at the time of the revelation of the Quran. This is something new. This blank verse is something new and has reached the east from the west. Number two, this is not a book in the general sense of the word. A book, you know, necessarily consists of chapters. And from one chapter to another, you have to proceed. You discuss something, some issue in one chapter. Now you don't repeat it in the second. Now you go forward. Take the argument ahead. In the third chapter, now you are going 
further ahead. Don't repeat anything which you have said in the first chapter. This is not the beauty of the book. But we find in Quran the incident of Adam and Iblis repeated in seven surahs. Six surahs from the Makki Quran and the seventh one, Surah Al-Baqarah from the Madani Quran. Surah Al-Araf, Surah Al-Hijr, Surah Al-Bani Israel, Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Al-Taha, Surah Al-Saad, go on. Actually, this is not a book. That definition of book doesn't apply to it. And we can't call its surahs as chapters. Both these words are not applicable to the Quran. These things should be known, especially to the youth, so that they are not disappointed. If you think it's a book and you start reading it, you will find, well, what's, what kind of book it is? It is repeating the same. This subject was discussed in Surah Al-Baqarah, again we find it. In Surah Al-Araf, again we find the mention of that event. In Surah Al-Hijr, again in Surah al Israel, again in the very next Surah, Surah Al-Kaf. So actually this is not the book. And here let me quote from Allama Iqbal, in kitab e nist this is not a book, it's something else. But I'm not going to the second part of this couplet because it will take me away from the topic which I'm discussing presently. Always a book, but you don't think it's a book in the general sense of the word in which you use the word book. So what is it then? The style of Quran is that of sermon, khutbah. Oration, oratory. We can call Quran a collection of divine orations. An oration delivered at a particular moment. Then another oration being delivered at another moment. The context has changed. The conditions have changed. Some of the things are still relevant. Some, some other things have faded away from the relevance. So, but you know, the relevant things have to be repeated again. But those things about which the relevance has gone will not be repeated. But the sermons are repeated. You find things repeated, repeated, repeated in sermons. So actually sermon, I think is not the proper word. But I can't have another word which is equivalent to khutbah. Khutbah is something very profound. Khitabat, oratory, is something else. And sermon is something else. Sermon, sermon has a limited sense of giving some advice. We can call it was. But khutbah, khatib. Khitabat, these words, you know, they have a more profound connotation. So this is a collection of divine orations. But now, please note five things, which are, so, so to say, the corollaries of, be, of this book being a collection of khutbas, divine khutbas. khutbat e ilahiyah majmua khutbat e ilahiyah These are, this is a collection of the khutbat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, in khutbah, there in oration or a speech, let me use this word, there must be a close rapport between the speaker and the audience. They must be seeing eye to eye with each other. If the rapport is not there, khutbah becomes ineffective. So khutbah has to keep its connection alive with the environment. It can't go beyond the environment. It has to address the people who are present there. They are actually to be addressed. What is their level of thinking? You must keep in mind. If the congregation is of a lower level of consciousness and you are speaking at a very high level of consciousness, well, you are doing some zoom to them. It's injustice to them. They won't be able to take it. And if the audience is of a very high level of consciousness and learning and understanding, and now you are giving him, giving them a sermon, so they will feel insulted. What is he talking to us? Don't we know all these things? So actually, in khutbah you have to keep in mind the level, the thinking, and you know the thought of the people to whom you are addressing. There should be a very complete rapport. Number two, in khutbah, many things which are understood are omitted. I am addressing you, and between me and you something is understood. I need not repeat it. I need not utter it in words. I know that you know it already. 
so there are you know omissions and those omissions are left willfully because you know otherwise it will be useless use, use useless you know increase of words and volume there are omissions regarding those things which are absolutely understood and clear which are common to both no need to discuss it number 3 and this is very important change in the address and the pronouns changing from the first order to the second to the third you know a speaker for example just imagine a political speaker standing before an audience and he is addressing people sometimes he is talking to them sometime he addresses someone who is not there in the times of ayub khan you know people were addressing ayub khan ayub khan was not there in the audience in the congregation in the meeting but they were addressing they were addressing bhutto bhutto was not there but you know one who is not present is being addressed as if he is present in the second grade of pronouns although it he belongs to the third grade he is not there and sometimes those who are present are supposed to be not present and you are talking in generalized terms although you are addressing them but you don't address them directly but you omit that so actually that's the beauty of the sermon and that is the literary beauty of the sermon and number 4 in a khutbah there is should be appeal to both the intellect and the emotions of man you have to address the man wholesome not in pieces when you are writing a book on philosophy you are appealing only to reasoning and intellect not to emotions if you write something emotional in a book of, of on philosophy well you fail you are not doing your job actually and if in some vast now you are discussing high philosophy and logic you are doing something wrong but when you are addressing a man now man every man has some intellect some understanding it might be high it might be low his understanding and then he every man he or she male or female has emotions also that are part and parcel of our personality so a khutbah has to move both it is appealing to both both to the mind and to the heart it is addressing the intellect as well as the emotions of the audience finally in khutbah and this is common between khutbah and shair in ghazal and qasida also the beginning and the end they are most important if a khatib has started his lecture in a way that he absorbs the attention of the audience he is a successful speaker and if not well he will go on talking and people will be thinking this way or that way seeing this way or that way you have to get their attention absorbed towards you so the beginning should be absorbing it should be you know which 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 will take the attention of the people towards you focus the attention of the people towards you and then in khutbah you discuss something to the left something to the right you have appealed to the intellect at one time and you have appealed to the logic or or emotions at the other time but in the end then again there should be some profound and complete message should be delivered because the last impression that is the actual actual impression that is the that is to last the final impression so that is why we find in quran the khawatim and fawatih fawatih usur khawatim usur in most of the surahs the beginning you know it's very majestic glorious in a special way and endings are also in a very profound way khawatim of surah al baqarah the three ayat fawatih surah al baqarah fawatih the beginning ayat of surah al imran and the ending ayat of surah al imran go on and see you will find that both these and in ghazal and qasida also you have definite terms this is maqta this is matla the first you know the couplet if it absorbs you then actually you are a successful poet and then the maqta maqte mein aa padi hai sakun gasta rana baat the maqta should be very powerful so actually that also applies to khutbah that the beginning and the end has to be more effective more profound now i come to the next topic synthesis and basic constituents of the quran you know every language 
consists of in final analysis the alphabets A, B, C, D, Alif, Ba, Ta, Sa. Arabic has also its own alphabets. Then the alphabets they go to make words, words of two kinds, meaningful, meaningless, muhammal, kalame, mufid. Then words are joined together, complexes. But there are complexes which are complete sentences, and there are complexes in which a, com a sentence is complete. It gives this meaning fully. Independent of any other thing, it can convey its own meaning. It's a sentence. And then you know, you join together the sentences in the form of an essay or so, or so on. But all this terminology is not applicable to the Quran. Although the letters are the same, Alif Bata Sa Jim Ha Ha. But you know, when these letters go to make words, and then when these words are joined together to make ayah, you can't call ayah a sentence, you can't call ayah a verse. None of these two words is applicable to ayah. The final unit of Quran is ayah. Ayat is the plural, ayah. What is ayah? Ayah means in Arabic a sign, a symbol, a sign for something. You see something and at once your attention is drawn to another thing. You remember something, it's sign, symbol. Symbol denotes something. You see a symbol and your mind is attracted towards something, turned towards something. So actually the ayah, the ayat of Quran, they are the signs and symbols of divine knowledge and wisdom. No word can be substituted for the word ayah. Must keep this word. Neither sentence, nor nothing, nor, nor verse, no other, no vocabulary is applicable. Now, we find ayat in the Quran consisting of mere letters, separated letters. Ha mean. We don't know the meaning. Alif, Lam, Meen, pronounced separately. Huruf muqatta'at. But this is ayah. One, one letter is not an ayah. There are three places in the Quran, three surahs, we start with one letter. Qaf wal Quran al Majid. Ayah is not at Qaf. It is Qaf wal Quran al Majid. Now it's the first ayah. Noon wal Qalam wa ma yasturun. The ayah will end at yasturun. Saad wal Quran is this zikr. So one letter doesn't comprise an ayah, but there are ayat comprising two letters. Hamid, Taseen, Taha, Yaseen, two letters, but this is ayah. Then there can be ayah of one word. Walas, although it's a complex, harfajar and majroor, but actually, commonly we should say it's one word. But what does it mean? Walas, it is not giving you anything. What is the meaning? It's an oath, it's, you are swearing by the time, but on what? Unless there is muqsam alayh, along with the muqsam bihi, you don't understand what the, what the speaker is trying to say. But it is an ayah. Then there are ayat which consist of complete sentences. Inna linsana lafi khusr. Complete ayah and complete sentence. Then there are ayat which have more than ten sentences in one ayah. Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. La ta'akhuduhu sinatun wa la nawab. Lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-lar. Man dhal ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'izni. So many sentences getting together, together. And the ayah is one. Ayatul Bir. Ayah number 177 of the Surah Al-Baqarah. In the same way, you know the ayah, very long ayah, on Dan in Surah Al-Baqarah. So there are very lengthy ayahs. Now these ayahs, as I told you, there are very small ayahs. Hamim, one ayah. Walas, one ayah. Then there are very lengthy ayahs, having ten or more, even more than ten sentences in one ayah. So what's the principle on which this enumeration of ayat is based? Please note, 
it is not based on any principle of grammar, not on any principle of diction, not any principle of logic. This is tawqifi, amr tawqifi, maqoof. It's dependent on what the Prophet told us, that's all. No logic, no rule of grammar, no rule of logic, nothing of the sort. Only Muhammad told us this is one ayah. There can be difference about the riwayah, where the ayah ends. But the basic, the basic decision has to be taken on the telling of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. ala That is the term tawqifi. These things are tawqifi. They are not derived by any rule of logic. They are not based on any rule of grammar. But they are based only on what the Prophet told us. Now these ayat, the, what is the second? <coughs> these ayat, they go to make surahs. What is surah? The number of the ayat of the Quran, it's different according to different enumerations. More than 6,000, no doubt. But you know there are differences based on, for example, one thing. Ayah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is written before 113 surahs of the Quran. Should it be enumerated and counted every time? That's one view. If you count according to this, the number will raise, we will be raised by 113. If you don't count, the count will be less by the same figure. So the number of ayat is not agreed upon. Ayat are agreed upon. But the enumeration system that is different by different authorities and muhaqqiqeen and researchers. So there's, there's a difference of opinion about the number of the ayat, but actually it is based on the saying of the Prophet But as I told you, there's no difference between the, the total number regarding it's more than 6,000. Now we come to surah. What is surah? Surah is not a chapter I told you. But this word sur, what does it mean? This is there in Surah Al-Hadid. Sur means, you know, the high wall that used to encircle the cities and towns in the olden days. The ramparts, they are the sur. So actually, a city is situated within a sur. What does it denote? Every surah of Quran as I told you, every ayah of Quran is a sign and symptom, and symbol, not symptom, symbol of the divine knowledge and wisdom. In the same way, every surah of the Quran is a city of divine knowledge and guidance, and hikmah and marfa. And around all those cities, there's a rampart which is encircling it. So now, within this rampart, you have a surah. So surahs, here again, as I told you, we can't use the word chapter. Absolutely irrelevant, inapplicable, wrong. We have to retain this basic terminology. Ayah, keep it as such. Surah, keep it as such. And there's no difference regarding the number of the surahs. It's 114. These surahs, they are very small also. Three of them are consisting of three ayat only. Suratul Asr, Suratul Nasr, Suratul Qasr, three ayat each. Then we have Suratul Baqarah, Nearly 300 ayat, 286 ayat in one surah. So they are small, just as the ayat are small also, large also, big also. In the same way, surahs are very big also and very small also. Now the third thing that we find in the days of the Prophet, third term is hizb, ahzab, which we now, nowadays call manzil, manazil. The surahs were grouped together so as to make nearly equal seven parts of the Quran. Because in the days of the Prophet and the days of the companions, they used to complete the reading of the Quran every week. For that they needed, you know, that Quran should be divided into seven parts, so that you read and recite one part in one night, the second one in the second night, the third one in the third night, so that you are completing your Qiraat and your Tilawah of the Quran in one week, every week you are doing it. 
So for that purpose, these surahs were grouped. And there is a great beauty in these surahs because this, you know, figure was present in the days of the Prophet and the companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in. So it's beautiful. There's not, not, nothing wrong about it. Because we find that there is a gradual increase of the number of surahs in these hizb and manasib. Leaving alone Surah Fatiha is actually the, you so to say, the dibacha, the, the preface of the whole of the Quran. Then the first manzil or shizb consists of three surahs. Second, five. Third, seven. Fourth, nine. Fifth, eleven. Sixth, thirteen. And then the multiple of thirteen, sixty-five surahs in al-hizbul mufassal. The last hizb, the last manzil of the Quran consists of sixty-five surahs. But you know, the beauty of the numbers is there. So actually, this topic has not been completed. I'll be discussing it, inshallah, in the second lecture also. And in the second lecture, then we have to proceed to some more important aspects of our discussion today. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisairil muslimin wa al-muslimat.